I'm Yaris, welcome to 93, you're joining me for Open Heart, Second Year, Chapter 4, Blind Spot. A week after deciding to keep the news of the budget crisis to yourself. You're summoned to an all-hand staff meeting in the lecture hall. You find seats with Bryce and Jackie. Any idea what this is about? They're basically leaving a skeleton crew running things to get everyone in here. It must be pretty important. Must be. And I think I have an idea what it is. All was packed to the brim. Dozens of doctors, nurses, technicians standing in the aisles to fit. Naveen solemnly walks to the podium in the spotlight and reads a prepared statement. Recently, Governor Riviere visited Edenbrook ahead of annual budgeting. However, despite her glowing remarks about the facility, this year's budget will be... Eliminate much of the governor's subsidies upon which we rely. Immediately, nervous whispers pass through the crowd. The board and administration have been examining our financial situation. Rest assured that we will do everything in our power to keep Eden Brook open. In the meantime, we will need to make certain changes in order to stave off the worst effects. Naveen continues reading off a list of changes to staff schedules, vac vacation policies, insurance payments, and among changes to payroll, new residences will temporarily stay at their intern year salaries. That's not good. We're not getting our raises? They can't do that! Yes, they can! We have to do our part, Jackie. Our part. Casey, we do our part. We work 80 hour a week saving people's lives. And they don't pay us enough to live in the city. It won't last long, Jackie. They'll figure it out. We'll get back to normal. Not in the mood for sunny optimism right now, Lahaley. Glance around, watching the anxiousness ripple through the room. I can't believe this, Graham. How long have they been sitting on this bombshell? You talked to the governor personally, didn't you, Casey? Did you know anything about this? I... God damn it. I mean, I might as well be honest now. I mean... I did it to keep things a secret. It wasn't my place to tell. I heard from Dr. Ramsey a week ago. Wait, seriously? He asked me to keep it quiet until the board had more answers. Of course. As Naveen fields anxious questions, you duck out to start your shift, but find Ethan leaning on the rear doors. Thank you, Dr. Valentine. I know it was difficult to keep this to yourself. Well, I figured you were right. It wouldn't go... It wouldn't do any good to rile everyone up sooner than necessary. Not when patients are counting on us. Like you said, it was out of our hands. We have to focus on what we can control. Precisely. And that starts with our next patient. Come with me. You accompany Ethan to the diagnostics examination room, where Baz and June are chatting with the patient. Good morning. Who said that? The woman's eyes search the area where your voice came from, but never meet yours. Evelyn, please meet doctors Ramsey and Valentine. Doctors, this is Evelyn D. La Vega. She's suffering from sudden onset of total vision loss. When did this start? Did you notice any signs beforehand? Any trauma? Nope, not at all. Two days ago, poof, I woke up and thought I was still the, the dead of night. If it doesn't clear up soon, I'm going to miss my very first gallery exhibition. Evelyn, here is a painter. Oh. You'll be painting again before you know it. You sound so confident, Dr. Valentine. Because I am. You couldn't be in better hands. Evelyn relaxes a little, sinking into the pillows of the hospital bed. I'm convinced. Dr. Valentine, why don't you take a closer look? Okay, Evelyn, stay still now and keep your eyes open for just a moment. Examine her eyes. I can see the red reflex, no, uh, opacification. Rules out vitreous hemorrhage or, uh, Everyone, no, any chronic conditions not on your chart? I'm pretty healthy for a 60-year-old, if you don't count the leg cramps I get from standing all day in the canvas. Could it be a clot? 
in both eyes at the same time, unlikely, but we could run an ABI to be sure. Charts show blood pressure is a little high, but not enough to, mali to uh, for malignant hypertension. Evelyn, did you ever have chicken box as a kid? Who didn't? Actually, I, I didn't, but shh, don't tell anyone. Could be VZV coming back after dormancy in the nerves. Good idea. Let's run a test for that and do uh, ABI as well. Evelyn, we'll be back soon. As the team files out, Evelyn touches your hand, looking blankly into the space near you. Thank you, Doctor. I owe you a portrait when I get better. After ordering the test for Evelyn, you assign your intern some new cases. And then, uh, Mr. Daniels in room 904, presenting with difficulty breathing and edemia. So, it's probably heart failure exacerbation. Got it. Are you all set? I gotta run and put five hours in at the clinic. That sounds awful. Well, it'll be you next year, so enjoy your intern year while it lasts. You leave Esme and hurry down for your weekly hours at the Edenbrook's free community clinic. You squeeze through the narrow halls where patients crowd by the dozens, waiting all day in hopes of being treated. There's no way this clinic stays open, even if the hospital survives a crisis. What will happen to all these people? One by one, you take patients from the packed waiting room into a small treatment room. What seems to be the trouble? I... I'd be stuck. <sighs> we'll put a Lego guy's head up his nose, and I can't get it, the damn thing out. Will? What did the Lego guy to do to deserve this? He wanted to explore. I uh, can't fault that logic. You delicately shine a pen light up the boy's sinuses. Can you get it out? My trusty sucker hasn't let me down yet. You see as many patients as you can manage during your shift, then head up to the cafeteria to recharge a familiar voice rings out. Casey! Kira, hey, I didn't know you had treatment scheduled for today. Do you want some company? Yes, to the company, but no to the treatment. I'm here for a good reason for a change. I have a job interview. Inbrook's looking for a new administrative assistant. Oh, from the sound of it, they could definitely use help in that department. It's just a temp job, but I do have a counting degree and a whole lot of medical bills. Two birds, one stone. Kira, it would be so great if you worked here. Right? I mean, I already know so much gossip about all the doctors. Now I just have to ace the interview. Are you nervous? Oh, hell yes. I really, really want this job, Casey. I'm so sick of being Cancer Girl. Nobody sees you as Cancer Girl. Tell that to the family and uh, all my other friends. All they want to do is talk about how I am, how I'm feeling, how scared I am, how am I coping, how am I so brave, and I don't even have anything else going on in my life to change the subject to. All I do is get treatment and recover from it. It's boring and exhausting, awful and scary, and... Oh, Kira, I'm so sorry. Don't be. I'm done wallowing in it. I'm ready to be a real person again. I want to complain about my job, gossip with my co-workers, and not think about the things growing in my lungs. Now, all I have to do is make sure I don't let my nerves screw up the interview. Help Kara boost her confidence in the job interview. Learn more about how her fight against cancer is going. She literally said she doesn't want to talk about it. We're going to talk about it. Oh my god. Help her ace her interview. Hope you're all having a good day. Why don't I help you prep this thing? You're a freaking angel, Casey. Come on, let's find somewhere quiet. You lead Kieran to the beautiful, quiet garden on the hospital campus. What is this place? It's a serenity garden. Sometimes they uh, take the psych patients here. And now it's for psyching me up. Was that in poor taste? I'm sorry, I'm nervous. You and Kara take a seat on the wooden bench. Bumblebees float drunkenly around you, bobbing from flower to flower. So, who's your interview with? There, uh, there's gonna be a couple of them. One is, uh, the Chief Dr. Banerjee. Oh, lucky you, Naveen's a teddy bear. And then there's Dr. Phillips. 
Uh oh, she's prickly. And then there's Dr. Wilcog. Oof. Why? Oof. He likes to trip people on. He's an amazing physician, but he's the worst doctor to do rounds with. He's always giving everyone around him these tough pop quizzes. So, how do I prepare her for it? Through time honored art of role play. Kinky. Arr. Let's start with Dr. Minerji. Just imagine that I'm a cuddly old man who genuinely cares about his patients and staff alike. Imagination engaged. Okay, Miss Santana. Why do you want to work at Edinburgh? Well, Dr. Benerji, as you know, I'm currently a patient in Edinburgh, so I'm very familiar with the hospital and the staff. The atmosphere you've created here is truly special. Everyone clearly wants the best for their patients. That's something I'd very much like to be a part of. A fine answer, Miss Santana, but you are aware that administrative assistance doesn't have to uh, much to do with the patient care? I respectfully disagree, Dr. Benerji. A patient care starts from the top down. The administration is responsible for the entire patient experience at Edinburgh. I think it's easy to get bogged down with the spreadsheets and start to see people as numbers. But that won't happen with me, because I am one of those numbers. Excellent point. Thanks, and since you're the chief, you get to tell the others to hire me, right? Not quite. Let's move on to Dr. Phillips. How prickly is this woman exactly? Try imagine Eeyore with a caffeine addiction. <laughs> oh god. Oh no. Yeah, and don't try to make her laugh or cheer her up. It just annoys her. Just answer her questions. Noted. She's a pessimist who... Uh, so she's gonna expect the worst. You can't tell her to take anything on faith. You have to be convincing. So basically she's about numbers. Square your shoulders and put on your best frown. Miss Santana, it says you uh, have lung cancer? We're looking for a candidate who can work a, long, a lot of hours. How can you expect to uh, concentrate on your work? Mmm, a lot of hours. How could you be able to fulfill the job's hours when you have frequent treatment sessions followed by debilitating side effects? I've always been a multitasker, Dr. Phillips. Just because I'm fighting cancer doesn't mean that that's all I'm doing. So far, I've put uh, three-hour sessions to using uh, my f about freelancing accounting work, and references are glowing. And as for side effects, I organize my work schedule to accommodate my recovery time. This was not affect my productivity. I see. How about that? Assertive. I like it. Okay, let's do uh, Dr. Wilcock. Wilcock always wants you to think outside the box, past the obvious solutions. You touch your fingertips together and make your face unreadable. Ah, she's pulling a meat! <clears throat> I should ask a question about... A calling. You learn that one of our doctors is stealing from the hospital. Do you report them to the chief or issue them a warning? Can I ask what this person is stealing, and if they're a resident or attending? Let's say something um, seemingly innocuous. Putting cups and linen, and they're an intern. Firstly, I'd ask how their financial situation is, because if an employee at a hospital like Edinburgh has to steal linen, they're in dire straits. Not really, seriously, look at right now, we all need linen. Is it a joke, Miss Santana? Not at all. I would offer my services to help them go over their budget. I would also uh, look into directing them towards some sort of financial aid program. As to answer your question, I don't think it would be within my power to issue a warning. But this is, isn't something I'd go to the chief over, either. I'd talk to uh, the resident about it. If the resident deemed it an issue, I'd expect they'd advance through the correct channels. Correct, and remind me to see about your finances. Anytime. I think you're gonna do great, Kira. You convince me. That's a relief. Honestly, I wish you didn't have to do this at all, though. You mean hand my paychecks right back to the hospital to pay off fighting cancer in my 20s? Yeah, it's not great. But hey, if adversity builds character, I'm gonna have the most character you've ever seen in your life. <laughs> okay, I like that. I like that. I like the cut of your jam. How has your uh, chemo been going? 
same old, same old. Nausea, puking all the time, mood swings, weight swings. I, I look but good bald, though. Agreed. My doctor says it's uh, going well, though, and lately I'm beginning to be able to imagine a future. Whenever I imagined the future before, it was just darkness. But now it's like I might beat this. That's crazy. And that just means I'll have to do all the normal adult stuff, pay bills, have a resume, maybe even go back to school. Stuff I never considered before. Kara. I know it's still good news. I should be happy. I am happy. But it's also weirdly scary. That time isn't going to stop for me. It'll keep moving. I know. That's stupid. It's not stupid, Kara. Time is scary. The future is scary. But all you can do is... But all you can do is take one day at a time. If you think about the whole life in front of you, the future barreling down like a freight train, that's overwhelming. But if you think about the challenges just for today, then it doesn't seem that big. This interview feels pretty big to me. Yeah, but it's today, so... <clears throat> Kira, you know I think you're perfect for the job. But if you don't get it, so what? This won't define your life either way. There will be more interviews and more towns and more friends to help you find your path. You've just got to live for today. Given how long I've wondered if I wouldn't wake up tomorrow, I think I can manage that. I know I complain that uh, everything has defined me as a cancer girl, but if I'm being honest... I've defined myself that way for a very long time. If I beat this, if I'm not Cancer Girl, then who am I? I have no idea. But this interview, I think, is my first baby steps towards whoever that person is. I can't wait to meet her. <clears throat> Me neither. Kira checks her watch. Oh hell, the interview's in ten minutes. No, oh, good thing you're uh, beyond ready. Come on. I'll walk you over. You and Kira make your way back through the hospital and stop towards outside Naveen's office. Thanks for helping me out, Casey. I was so nervous on my way in here, but now I think I might actually have this in the bag. Let me know how it goes. Absolutely. She raises her chin and knocks on the door. Come in! Good luck. An hour later, you hear an excited shriek ring out across the atrium. Casey, I got it! I got the job! I knew you would. How were they? Pretty much exactly how you described, and they want to start onboarding me right away. It sounds like they're in some hurry. Is something going down? <clears throat> yeah, you could say that. I'm sure soon you'll know more than I do. Well, so long as they don't have me cooking the books, Hell, even then, I'm just glad to have something to do. Welcome to the family, Kara. Later that night, at Donna Hughes. You and your friends carry your drinks to the booth where Sienna has fallen asleep. She startles as you return. <laughs> Bad dreams? Um, you seem so exhausted lately, Sienna. I'm fine. Interns are just a lot of work. Kara enters the bar and comes over. Kara, KC was telling us earlier about how you crushed your interview. Welcome to the team. I heard you got grilled by Phillips and Wilcog. They were very impressed, mainly due to KC's awesome prep work. I was even ready for the trick questions and everything. Happy to help. So, when do you start? Technically, it was supposed to be tomorrow, but they were kind of in a big rush. They threw me right into the books to try and start shuffling money around. It's that bad, huh? Pretty much everything is on the chopping block. The clinic, the diagnostics team are expensive to run. The diagnostics team? They have a national profile. They probably bring in tons of patients to Edinburgh. Yeah, but we take cases based on merit. Our patients pay what they can. That means half the cases end up pro bono. Sounds like you guys need to start praying for some billionaires to get seriously get sick. Way ahead of you. Actually, Kira, would you... Would taking on some wealthy patients offset the cost of pro bono patients? Huh? Sure, I guess. 
Ooh, like Gwyneth Monroe. Who? Oh. <clears throat> Sienna taps on her phone and slides it over to you. Yeah, the profile of a beautiful young woman fills the screen. She's an influencer. She started out doing makeup tutorial videos, and she's really good. But she's also really positive and sweet. Now, she has uh, two self-help books, a reality show, 15 million followers, and a mystery illness. Sienna reaches over to hit play on Gwyneth's most recent post. Gwyneth's lovely face fills the screen, tears streaming awfully down her cheeks. I'm so scared, guys. No matter what I do, no matter how much I eat, I keep losing weight. The doctors won't take me seriously. They send me to psychiatrists, give me pamphlets for eating disorders. They think I'm doing it to myself. I'm so tired all the time. I've thrown up three times today. I just want to know what's wrong with me, even if even if it's terrible news. I can understand that. Wow, Gwen definitely seems like she could use our help. Nobody deserves to be dismissed by other doctors. Kind of like me. That's true. Even if she does sound like kind of an airhead. How did she sound like an airhead? She said something normal, but you know what I'm mad. <clears throat> if you got people like her to come to Edinburgh, that might just keep your team off the chopping block and let you keep treating the people who can't pay for it. And it would also give you an influencer in your pocket, too, to say. There's just one problem. The diagnostics team never sought out patients. They come to us. We don't come to them. How on earth am I going to get Dr. Ramsey to agree to this? At night, you're sitting on the couch when a loud knock rouses you. You answer it to find your landlord. Farley, what's going on? Your check's bounced! If this is some tenant's rights crap, I swear! My check hasn't bounced. What are you talking about? Yours is fine. It's the hot one that's the problem. The Indian girl with all the leather. Well, that's very racist of you. Jackie's check bounced. After Farley storms off, you turn to Jackie to see Jackie emerge from her room. Hey, sorry about that. We're not going to address what he just said. All right. Jackie, are you in trouble? Huh? No, of course not. She folds her arms defiantly, but she looks embarrassed. Her eyes are red. Jackie, I can't help me, or you, if you don't tell me what's wrong. I know you think you can fix everything, but you can't. This is my problem. Try me. Jackie sighs and looks at the ceiling in an exasperation. I'm broke, Casey. Since when? I'm neck deep in mid-school debt. I'm paying off nothing but interest. I thought I could skate a buy until our raises this year, but now you don't have anyone you can ask for help? My family isn't exactly in a position to bail me out. Not that I'd ask them anyway. I dug this hole and I'm gonna dick myself out. Why didn't you ask one of us for help? Because you're all poor too. Except Aurora, I guess. She wipes her eyes with a dry laugh, and two of you collapse on the couch. She lingers her head on your shoulder with a heavy sigh. What am I gonna do, Casey? Gotta start making some extra money. You flip open your laptop and start searching short-term jobs in your area. Hey, look, a babysitting job here in the building. That's not too bad. You could even get some studying done while making extra cash. I'm not exactly great with kids. You learn to be. But you've got practice with interns, and that's gotta be harder. Trust me, I've babysat before, it's a piece of cake. Well, I don't know if I'm cut out for this, but maybe if you could show me the ropes? What the f- mm. Convince Jackie to take up her babysitting, you help her get back on her feet and spend some time alone. Apparently we've become the self-help aid for everyone. Oh, help Jackie babysit. Babysitting's easy money. You turn up, feed the kid, put on a movie, and then wait for them to fall asleep. Oh, it's not that easy. Jackie grimaces. A teenager could do this, Jackie, and you're way smarter and more capable than 16-year-old. I guess it would fit into my schedule better than an actual second job. A few minutes later, Jackie is dialing the number on the job posting. Uh-huh, my name is Dr. Jackie Va- No, no, everything's fine. 
I live in your building and saw that you were looking for a babysitter. I'd love to offer you my services. Some that... Right now? Uh, sure, I'm free. I'll be right over. She hangs up and blinks at you. I guess I'm starting to nine. Want some company? <sighs> I didn't offer that, goddammit. Oh my freaking god, yes. Please teach me how to do this. Ten minutes later, you and Jackie are standing inside a cozy apartment on the fifth floor. Oh my goodness, we can't tell you how grateful we are for this. My work's been planning this event for months, but we've had hard, uh, had so much to trouble finding a sitter. We were so sure we wouldn't be able to go. You're a pair of lifesavers or career savers. Uh, you're welcome. Where is the little, um, <clears throat> angel? She's playing in her room. She hates to come out and say goodbye to it. All you have to do is feed Lulu and get her to bed. Don't try to do anything too complicated. Complicated. What exactly do you mean by that? Oh, nothing. Just don't try too hard to entertain her. She'll entertain herself. You just have to get through it. Huh? Our numbers are on the fridge. If there's an emergency, well, you're both doctors, right? Right. We'll handle it. Good luck! Remember, you're the grown-ups here. She has no power over you. The door closes behind them. Did that sound ominous to you, or do all parents talk like their kids like that? No, that was definitely weird. Well, I guess we'd better go and meet her. Jackie lightly taps on the bedroom door and then opens it to sweet-faced girl sits on the floor coloring a picture. Yep, this is how every horror movie starts. Hi, Lulu. I'm Jackie, and this is... Why does your face look like that? Like, what? You look sad. Old. Are you sad and old? No, I'm annoyed and young. Got a problem with that? <laughs> the kid turns her attention to you. What's your excuse? For what? Your eyes. You've got bags bigger than my backpack underneath them. And darker. You look like you've been punched in the face. Like, a lot. Um... Let's get you something to eat. I don't want to eat. I want to color. Well, you need to eat. Kids who don't uh, get nasty stomach cramps. I want to color. Uh, Casey, this sucks. Let's go. What? We can't go. Uh, yeah. You can't leave me. That's child abandonment. You'll go to jail. It's abandonment if your parents leave. We're just too random... Two randoms your parents let inside because they couldn't find anyone else to put up with your with you. The only consequence of us leaving you alone is your parents throwing a fit. And uh, I have noise canceling headphones, so they can scream outside my apartment door all they like. Lulu blinks at Jackie, awed. What's for dinner? Let's see what your parents have. I mean, they did say you have no power, or they have no power over you. You make up three bowls of macaroni and cheese as Jackie sits at the kitchen table with Lulu. So you've seen a dead person? I've seen a hundred dead people. We used to cut them open for surgical rotation in med school. Seriously? Did you see their organs? Yeah, that's what surgery is. What's the grossest thing you've ever seen? I saw a liver that was uh, fully rotted inside a guy once. It was super slimy and disgusting. Cool. You must be like a thousand times smarter than you look. You look from Lulu's delighted face to the macaroni and cheese, a brilliant idea comes to you. I should make it look like Guts brains. You find Lulu's mom's stash of baking supplies and shake a few drops of pink food coloring into the cheese sauce. Come and get your hot brains. Did you say brains? Yep. She races over to stare at the bowl of goopy pink mash. I hope you picked a smart cadaver. We don't want to eat any moron brains. Luckily, the cadaver was sent to the morgue with all of his SAT records. He was a bona fide genius. Cool! He snatches up the bowl and grabs Jackie's hand, dragging her back to the table. Tell me more about med school. Okay, on one condition. What? You eat. Shower, and then get into bed. And then I'll tell you all about the lady who died from a flesh-eating bacteria. Deal! She starts wolfing down her macaroni, barely stopping to breathe. You and Jackie grin at each other. <laughs> <laughs> I 
A few hours later, her parents returned to a silent, clean house. Where's Lulu? She's in bed. She fell asleep about an hour ago. You got her to get to sleep! You, you don't look upset. How do you not look upset? What? Was she nice to you? We've got thick skins. Can we call you again, please? Say we can call you again. My schedule can be tight with work, but as long as I'm free, I'm all yours. And Lulu's. She's a pretty cool kid. Lulu's mom squawks and wraps Jackie in a tight hug. We can never find anyone willing to come back. Thank you. Just because you have to amuse the child. She pulls 500 bucks out of her purse and presents it to Jackie's hands. This is way too much. Consider it a down payment. It's been so long since we were able to go out together. We'll call you in a few days to talk schedules. Yep, yeah, there you go. You and Jackie flop heavily onto the couch. He hands you some of the bills. Here, you're cut. No way. You charmed that scary little kid all by yourself. You earned them. But that's not fair. Life isn't fair. You can pay me back with a beer. She goes to the fridge and retrieves a pair of cans. I want mine in glass! How dare you! She passes you one, then holds up hers. Detaming demons. Ah, to lucrative side hustles. You tap your cans together and drink. Seriously though, Casey, thanks for helping me out tonight. Is that money enough to cover your overdraft fees? Yeah, and if I can score a few more of these jobs, it should just make up a lost pay at work. It's not exactly a long-term solution, but at least it gives me room to breathe. You just promise me one thing. What? If you ever get that stuck in with her money, you'll let me know. I promise. Next morning, you find Ethan alone in his office, reviewing Evelyn's reports. Okay, time to make a big pitch. Sit down across from him, he speaks without looking up from his papers. You want something? I, yeah, I'd like you to kiss my ass. How about that? <laughs> I like to think of it more of as a proposition. I know how we can save Edenbrook. Okay, you have my attention. We solicit for high-profile wealthy patients who can offset our costs. He holds her gaze for a long moment. No. Hear me out. If we... Casey, Naveen founded this team with the express mission of helping those with nowhere left to go. I can't abandon that mission. I won't neglect the people who need us, especially not in order to chase people who already have a vast array of health care options available to them. Ethan. We can do both. We don't have to neglect anyone. This is what we will this is what will allow us to keep treating the people you're talking about. I understand where you're coming from. You're thinking outside the box. But you're talking about changing what this team is. Temporarily, yes. We'll find another way. What if we don't? What if the time runs out? Are we supposed to just keep doing our work under until it's all over? Yes. I can live with that. Well, I can't. June knocks and pokes her head in. Ramsey Valentine got some more results. Let's go share the update with Evelyn. Morning, doctors. Or evening. Doctor? Singular? I can't even really tell. We got it. It's all of us, Evelyn. We have some updates. The chicken pox text came back negative, which is good news. And the test for ABI detected some peripheral artery disease. It's only in the limbs. A clot didn't cause your sudden vision loss. Evelyn hangs her head. You sit beside her and rest a hand on hers. We're not done fighting this. There are plenty of other causes that could still explain this. That's not it. It's silly. My exhibition is tonight. I would have loved to be there, you know? It's been painting. I've been painting my whole life. Barely scraped by. No one ever thought much of it. I'm 60 now and people finally cared. People finally wanted to see the world the way I saw it. And now I can't see it at all. Why are you delivering me to these fields, Pixelberry? Why? Evelyn, you still have plenty more, I know, and, and I look forward to attending. I would like that very much. 
Evelyn, I would like to test for a range of uh, demiliating diseases that could be affecting your optical nerves. And the high blood pressure could also be a sign of ACTH, a secreting tumor in the pituitary gland. Even a small one might be compressing the optic nerve. See, Evelyn, we're not done yet. Focus on getting better. I'll try. There's not much else I can do, after all. As June and Baz leave, you notice Ethan lingering behind in the hall. The world, the way I saw it. Ethan, what are you thinking? And he might change his mind on getting rich patients. That's what she said about her exhibition tonight. It's the world, the way I saw it. You think something in her painting might reveal something in her vision? It's worth a shot, at least. What do you say, Valentine? We have to wait on tests anyway. Shall we swing by the gallery tonight? Go to the gallery with Ethan. Sure, why not? You and Ethan find the gallery tucked away on a side street in the north end. The sign invites you to the local artist spotlight, introducing the work of Evelyn de la Vega. Wow, a full house. Evelyn would be proud. Well-dressed connoisseurs peruse the selection while waiters serve wine and cheese. So what exactly are we looking for? I'm not entirely sure. My hope is that there is something in her art over the last few months that might suggest a preceding symptom. Color, saturation, though I'm a little outside my wheelhouse here, and that's why I'm glad you came along. Immediately, you're drawn to... Mm, landscape of a farm. Ethan follows you, standing by your side as you examine the work, a rolling hill teeming with crops that glimmer in the sunrise, the scene surveyed by a towering barn. Wow, that one's pretty good, huh? As far as I can tell, she captures the light well. What do you think about the painting? I think it doesn't help our case. That's all? To be frank, I'd be totally understood and the real purpose of art. Uh, to me, art helps you explore your own feelings. It doesn't need a purpose. It's communication. It reveals the artist's soul to the audience. It's a communication deeper than you could otherwise imagine. It's true. At least for some artists, unless you're hanging a banana on a wall, then you're just an idiot. I understand that personally. I've never needed metaphors to communicate myself fully. Waiters bring my tree trays of cheese and wine glasses, and you help yourselves while exploring the other pieces. I understand, of course, that art aims to be the search for truth, but it's not. Truth is objective. There are facts, the cause, effects, art is subjective. It's in the eye of the beholder. But you love opera? Of course. I'm a human, after all. I admire the skill, the craft. I even admire the beauty. I, but to me, that's all it is. It's not the truth, the way others like it to make, to make it out to be. I don't begrudge anyone their search, but I think I'll stick to my history books. Ethan, everything is subjective when it comes down to it. If you intend to attack the foundation of my worldview, I hope you have some strong ammunition. I'm serious. Think about it. For example... What do you do? Okay, I'll play along. I'm a doctor. I diagnose illnesses and treat them. Why? Because other people will stay sick. Why does that matter? Because it's the right thing to do. Isn't that subjective? Ethan, you make moral and ethnical judgments all the time. I'll concede that we do apply subjective frameworks to a world of facts. It's just that. Art. That search for meaning in the mundane. It's fruitless. Many of our patients, Evelyn included, try to find meaning or poetry in their predicament. Some greater educational force, but there's nothing behind it beyond the mechanical cause. Sometimes, Ethan, no matter what you solve, you can't have all the answers someone needs. I don't entirely blame them. When something is so coincidental like Evelyn's condition, it seems personal. It's so punishing. You think there has to be some message to it. Punishing? To want to do something more than anything. You know, it's the one thing you can never do again. Your eyes meet for a long moment. Ethan, I... 
You trail off, distracted suddenly by a painting behind Ethan. He turns to follow your gaze to a landscape of a lighthouse on a rocky shore. What is it? I've seen this before somewhere, and something's missing. That's it. There were pieces of an old shipwreck on the rocks over in this corner. I saw it on our drive up to the Country Club last year. I remember thinking either that the lighthouse is bad at its job, or it's why they built the thing. Hmm. A missing detail. Is it a stylistic choice? You get your phone and pull up the photos of the other landscapes mentioned in the painting's names. And here, the farm one. Shouldn't there be a small stable here? Hmm. Interesting. In the same corner as the missing wreck. You compare more and more photos to the landscapes, putting together a pattern of small missing details in each one, organizing them chronologically. And the missing areas that the and the areas that are missing details have grown larger over the past year. It's... Scotoma. A blind spot. We've been testing for causes of sudden vision loss, but it wasn't sudden at all. It was gradual, and she didn't notice. Her mind was filling in the gaps. But... the... But what have we got... Oh, she told us the leg cramps from standing all day. What did people frequently take for nightly leg cramps? Something that can easily release, reach toxic levels. Quinanine. Quinanine toxicity could have caused Sotoma, leading to a total loss of vision. It stopped becoming recommended for the purpose ten years ago, but old habits die hard. Let's get back to the hospital to confirm. Ethan Wade. If we're right, that's not reversible. Yes, I'm afraid. Evelyn won't be regaining her vision, but Casey... I know, I know. Control what we can control. Ethan gives you a meaningful nod and heads for the door. You glance back at Evelyn's paintings one last time and follow him out into the night. <clears throat> I will not get emotional... <sighs> The next day, at the end of your shift, you pause by Evelyn's room, where she's hooked up to a hemoperfusion machine for her treatment. She's staring out at the sunset, though the window is uh, as if she could say it. You enter. Hi, Evelyn. It's... Dr. Valentine, I'm getting better at hearing. I was hoping to see you again. A poor choice of words, perhaps. You sit at her bedside. How are you feeling? This whole time, I thought if I regained my sight, I would be blessed with a whole new perspective. It seems I got that anyway. My daughter will be taking me home after my treatment. She's staying for a few weeks until we figure it out. Everything, I guess. Hmm, <clears throat> this one's a tough one. So before I answer this, I would like to propose an idea to you. Do you tell her that you went to the exhibition? Tell her that it was packed. That finally, after 60 years of her life, that after all of her struggles, that it finally paid off? <laughs> or do you tell her that... I'm sorry, I failed you. I don't look at it if there's anything else I can do. I don't. It has to be one way or the other. So yeah, that's the tough part. Oh, I went to your exhibition. Let's try that. I have something in my eye, I swear to God. You did. Dare I ask how it was? For some reason, I'm far more nervous about its reception than my own situation. Everyone loved how you saw the world. She smiles. Tears of joy welling in her shining eyes. Thank you, Dr. Valentine. There's actually another reason I'd hope you'd stop by. I have a present. It should be over there. She nods to a chair across the room where something reticular sits under a blanket. I told you I owed you a portrait when I got better, and this machine takes forever, so I had my daughter bring my supplies. You painted me a portrait? But... My daughter's very patient. She pointed out the colors on my palette. I know I've never seen you, but it's how you appear to me. How your spirit looks to me. 
You remove the blanket and see a small canvas blossoming with radiant colors. What can I say? I'm stubborn. Stubborn people find a way, even if I'm blind as a bat. Well, like I said, or like you said, there's more than one way to see. Damn it, Pixelberry, for getting something in my eye. And my nose. You're carrying your portrait home on the subway when you get a text from Aurora requesting a roommate meeting. By the time you're back, everyone's already gathered, sitting in a circle. Is everything okay? Look, if this is about the balance check, it's just because my paycheck was late. I'm good on rent now. That's not it. It's gonna be a chore chart, isn't it? I'm dreading this day. It's not that either, Elijah. Though it is a good reminder, we should do that. Rora tries to play it cool, but can hardly contain her smile. I've been offered a chance to transfer my residency to Mass Kenmore, and I've accepted. Oh my god! Is that a prank? Aurora. You called the guy from the deli. Oh, what guy? Aurora blushes as you fill in your friends on her heroic diagnosis in the deli. Whoa, Aurora. That sounds badass. So, who was the guy exactly? Tobias Carrick. He's an attending at Mass Kenmore. He set up a meeting with their chief of medicine yesterday, and they offered me a position this morning. Have you told your aunt yet? Not yet, but she's going to have to deal with it. My mind's made up and I'm not planning to move out, if you're wondering. I mean, you do you, but I don't get why you'd want to go there. Mass Kenmore's great, but it's not Edenbrook. That's exactly why I want to go. In Edenbrook, I'll always be Harmory, Harper Emery's niece. But Dr. Carrick didn't know who I was when he gave me that card. I want somewhere to make it on my own. It's time for me to carve a new path. Later that night, you're on the phone as you fall asleep. Your mind drifts back to the conversation at Donahue's with Sienna. You pull up Gwen, Gwyneth Monroe's profile. She's updated several times a day with six live video streams available from within the last 24 hours. This girl really puts it all out there. You scroll through a recent post, she's made seven in total about her sudden weight loss. You check the comments and wince at the unqualified advice. Yo, my aunt had this right before she croaked. It's definitely cancer, sorry. Oh my god, you're so lucky. I wish I suddenly lost 20 pounds. Yep, that's the comment you YouTube comment section. No wonder the poor girl's freaking out. She's got nowhere to turn, just like all of her other patients. Your eyes drift to the message button control what we can control. We still have options left, and Aurora's right. It's time to carve a new path. You hit the button and start typing. The diagnostics team may be on the chopping block. Will you be able to turn things around in time to save it? Once again, thank you all for watching. Hope you're all having a good day. Please remember to like, share, and subscribe. It's on your screen! Please do it! Without further ado, it looks like there's nothing going on this weekend, which uh, kind of all in all sucks, but uh, that's okay, because I'll be here for your content needs. We got Doom Eternal, we got Animal Crossing, and we've got Resident Evil 3 Remake. I know! I know! I know you're shocked. You're like, what the hell? It's okay. Come by my Twitch channel, come sit down, grab some popcorn, maybe something to drink, and I will entertain you. That's right. You've got nowhere else to go. <laughs> oh, making a joke at the sudden situation in our lives. Anyway, without further ado, um, to get to a small little, little uh, feeling I guess you could go with, is um, this book gets to me sometimes. It really does. And uh, long story short, it uh, it really sucks. You know, things like this happening. So it looks like Blades also of Light and the Royal Hair are on hiatus, correct me if I'm wrong, um, because it looks like just Monday is The Witness and then Saturday is Open Heart and then Bloodbound. So I don't know if Pixelberry's going to update that. If they haven't updated it yet, who knows? Well, I guess we'll see. Um, <clears throat> with that being said, oh, healthcare systems all around the world suck. Let's be honest. Um... 
we've just got to improve. You know, that's all I got to say. We've just got to improve. Um, everybody, regardless of your race, regardless of your height, regardless of your gender, whatever you want to be, need to band together. Whether we get through this or not, after we get through this, like we need to continue to band together, regardless where you live too, and band together and push because medical science has sat complacently by and just calmly like breezed through the years and we just need, need, need to push people to new heights and push people to help out. It's as simple as that. We really, really got to for everybody because everyone on this planet, whether you touch the burner 40 times and I'm allergic to ignorance and stupidity after I've told you 41 times and you keep putting your hand back on the burner, you still have a right to live. That's all I'm saying. You, everyone, regardless, still has a right to live, still has a right to care, you know? I live in a country where literally right now they're finally looking at people like me going, well, you have a right to live or a right to try to. It's the new thing they're calling it now, a right to try, where you've been diagnosed with a terminal ailment and at least we will continue to make your life bearable until the moment you croak. Up until now, it's pretty much been go fend for yourself. Hopefully it passes because until then, pretty much if I get what's going around, they pretty much stick me in a room and they say bye. I don't think you understand how bad the healthcare system is here in America, let alone all over the world. Doctors are being forced to make decisions. They look at two patients and they have to pick one. And that is the where we're at right now. And it's only going to get worse until we, together united, make it better. You know, you guys were probably maybe looking for a little bit more cheerful news, which it is. It is. But we all have to get together on this. And not just for this. This is this will go away, I promise you. This will go away eventually. But what about the next thing and the next thing? And your children, your grandchildren, etc. Come on, man. We we got to make this world a better place because you know what? This is our this is our world, okay? This is our world. I want you to see something real quick. This is our world. Well, except for the desktop thing, but you, you get the idea. This is our world. We should imagine ourselves looking over it and saying, how can we make this a better place for everybody regardless? Because by helping others affects yourself, you can sleep better at night at the very least. I don't know what else to say. I'm, I'm, I'm stressing, I'm urging you, and I'm urging every single one of you. Trust me, as a person who right now already has an expiration date, I'm sitting here... And I try and make you you guys smile and laugh and be happy and, and, and alleviate the woes of all this crazy, stupid crap right now. And I don't have to, you know, I can just sit here and game until the day I croak and, and just, you know, or whatnot, or just end things early, whatever. But long story short, you know, this is, this is where we are. We should care about one another. We really should, regardless of, of anything. Even age right now is a big thing that people are trying to push. It should be regardless. Whether you're a one-day-old or a 99-year-old, we should care about one another. It's as simple as that. So, thanks for listening. Catch you all in the next video. Peace.